is the, there's a black card which has a, a sentence with a blank or several blanks, and then each player is dealt a number of white cards with a word or phrase that they can use to complete it. Uh, and your goal is to complete the sentence in the most like, outrageous or outlandish or offensive way that you can, and then people choose which one is funniest. Uh, so uh, this, this would be an example of that kind of thing, with white cards and black cards. So I thought this sounded like it would make a fun demo. So uh, for today's lecture, we're going to be using an app that I wrote uh, using Node and using Mongo and using a lot of the same technologies you've been learning. Uh, but it's basically this game with an MIT twist. So uh, what I did is I went and I grabbed some excerpts from the MIT subject listings from the actual course description. So for example, the course description for 5.11.1, among other things, says that it is the introduction to blank, uh, with emphasis on blank. And then we can complete that with various amusing things, like introduction to selfies, with emphasis on spectacular apps, for example. So uh, I want to show you, just so you know this isn't vaporware, uh, this app. So I'm going to go over here, and I did not go to all the lectures last week, but I kind of looked them over, and I think they were similar to last year. So this should not look scary. It should actually look pretty familiar. I've got a server.js file, which might be called app.js for you, but it's not super long. It's like 200 lines or something. Uh, I've got some CSS styles. I've got some JavaScript files. Uh, nothing magical. I'm not using any crazy higher level abstract framework. I'm not using Meteor or Angular or anything. I'm just using Node, Express, and MongoDB. And I can run my app. Uh, I'm going to need to run two things. First, I'm going to need to run npm start in a console, which I can do. And we'll see that that will run my server.js. And then in a second console, I'm going to have to run MongoDB. So uh, Mongo is going to listen on port 27017, which is the default. Uh, up here, this is Node.js, it's going to run on port 80, and now, in theory, uh, I can go to my local host and I can see my app. Uh, and so here it is, uh, 801, students work in blank to do tabletop blank, uh, and I've been dealt a bunch of cards here, and I can make something up. Students work in, I don't know, uh, career fair t-shirts uh, to do tabletop uh, <laughs> Emotions. Yeah, that seems fine. Right. And so uh, I can submit that, and there's a billboard here where we can see, that was me trying it out earlier, uh, we can see and we can upvote the ones that we like. So this is, this is meant to be a multiplayer game, right? The challenge is that, at least right now, I'm the only one who can play it. Y'all can't play it. The reason is because it's just running on my laptop, right? You saw me launch the two processes that it's using. It's using Node, it's using Mongo, and they're both just on my local host. So that is the problem statement that we're going to tackle today. How can we get this to a point where it's out there for real on the internet and you can all connect with your laptops or phones and we can all play this game? Is everyone clear on the problem? Yes? Awesome. Cool. So let's talk about how people used to do this. So let's take a quick trip to the past. So back in, say, the 90s, the early days of the internet, the way that you would do this is you would go to Best Buy or Radio Shack or something and you would buy a computer, you'd take it home, you'd take it out of the box, you would plug it into power, plug it into the internet, and then set up your app, run the things in the console the way I just showed, and then sort of walk away and hope that it's there. And there are a couple of reasons this is not practical for you. Uh, the first one hopefully is really obvious, which is if I told you that to, to win this class you had to go buy a new computer, you'd just be like, no, right? Like, that's expensive. It's a high upfront cost, and it would largely be wasted cost, because probably some of you are just going to not do much with your apps after this class, right? So that's one reason this is impractical. Another reason is, like, what if you trip over the cable and unplug the server? Or what if there's a power outage or poor network connection to your house, right? There's all kinds of things that can go wrong. And if those things were to happen, then your app would go down for everyone, which is not what you want. I mean, you want to be able to, like, so to speak, close the lid at night, go to sleep, and have your app stay up, right? Uh, and then, of course, if, if suddenly you went viral and a bunch of people started hitting your website, you would have to, I guess, drop everything and go to Best Buy and buy more of these and plug them in, and it, would just, it wouldn't scale very easily. And then if everyone got tired of your app a week later, you'd just have a bunch of servers. So there are a lot of reasons this is no longer the way people do things. But it's useful to know that this is how people start. So what do people do today, if not this? They use the cloud. Now the promise of the cloud, and we'll get into more of what it is, but the promise of it 
is that it's a way that you can pay only for what you use. You can pay pennies a day. Uh, you can have a promise that your app is going to always be up. It's always going to be accessible. It's going to have fast, like low latencies, no matter where people try to access it. Uh, and that you'll be able to scale seamlessly. You can just start paying more pennies every day if you want more scale as you get more traffic. And then you can scale down, and you have no sunk cost. Uh, there's one more advantage that I think is really cool, which is you don't actually have to get out of your chair to use it, which is very nice. right? We're all in chairs. It would be cool if we could get this done without getting up. So, OK. So uh, that sounds wonderful. I've given all kinds of just fabulous properties to the cloud. So what is the cloud? Uh, and it turns out that actually people are pretty unsure of this out in the like broader public. So I, I grabbed a couple of news excerpts and kind of clippings and screenshots here. Um, now, credit to the woman down here in the bottom left. Uh, storage equals internet servers with like a little like that's the cloud is where Spotify lives. Like yeah, actually she's she's like mostly right. Um, but there are some there are some good ones. I like the hacker up there silhouetted against the ones and zeros. Uh, obviously CNN's hair is on fire as always. Uh, my favorite is actually the newspaper clipping up at the top, uh, where this the author felt that it would be helpful to just kind of clarify to people, hey, it's not an actual cloud. It is instead a bank of quote gigantic humming and whirring computers in a vast warehouse somewhere in North Carolina. Just again, actually kind of close, not bad. Uh, oh, this one's my favorite. Um, it turns out if you poll people, they're pretty sure that bad weather will take the cloud down. <laughs> Which, it, it doesn't, really. Extreme cases notwithstanding. OK, so maybe a more appropriate question is not what is the cloud, but what is a data center? And probably some of you know, and some of you are not as sure. So let's talk about that. So a data center is, in fact, a giant warehouse somewhere in North Carolina full of gigantic whirring and humming computers. Uh, it looks vaguely like this. Um, they're kind of hidden in plain sight. They're just all like huge buildings in the corner of a county that you've never been to. Uh, and inside, they're very clean, they're very orderly, and it's just filled with row after row after row of computers that are racked and stacked into server racks. And then running up the side of each rack, uh, there is a power cable and an internet cable going into each of the servers. And the whole point is you can just put your app here. So the cloud then, yes, it's a trendy buzzword that sort of vaguely suggests promise of being able to access your stuff from anywhere. Uh, it's also, though, very concretely, just a vast network of data centers that are run by big tech companies that provide utility-like access to storage and compute resources, right? The same way as you can just, like, get electricity, you can just, like, get storage, right? That's sort of the, what the cloud provides. So in the case of Facebook or Google, they both have built a lot of, of data centers. So Facebook, until very recently, had four, I think, and they just announced two new ones, so they're going to have six now. Uh, four of them, I believe, are in like the Americas. The two new ones are both in Europe. Um, but so they have built out a, a significant investment of data center infrastructure, and that allows them to serve the Facebook app service, right? So when you upload a photo, that's where your photo goes. Every time you open the app and it spins for a second and stuff appears, that stuff is coming to your device and being served to you from a computer somewhere in one of these six data centers. Google, similarly, has built a bunch uh, to serve their web properties, like Gmail or YouTube. Um, these are both good examples of clouds. The one that I want to talk about today is called Microsoft Azure. And the reason I want to talk about Azure is because it has a, it, it's different in an important way from, say, Facebook Cloud. Facebook's cloud is built for Facebook, right? They needed to deliver their app to you, and so they built out that infrastructure for themselves. Microsoft Azure is built for you. The whole point is that developers and organizations and individuals who do not want to go build their own data centers can essentially rent servers in Microsoft Azure to run their own apps. That's why it's relevant in the context of this class. Uh, now, Microsoft Azure uh, has a lot of data centers, actually. Uh, this is a map that's already a little bit outdated of some of the ones around the world. Uh, in terms of the number of data centers, it is the largest cloud in the world. Uh, and it allows you to have fairly low latency no matter where you are in the world when you access something that's running in Azure. Uh, now, there's a video uh, that I can show uh, that sort of heavy-handedly tells you how big it is. Uh, and then we can pick up from there.
Right, so we all agree they could have chosen more modest music. Um, <laughs> but I mean, understandably, these guys are fairly proud of what they've built. They've been at it for a long time, and they've spent a tremendous amount of money. Uh, the reason that we're here talking about this, obviously, uh, is that we're giving you guys access to Azure for free in the context of this class. So Microsoft is sponsoring 6148, which of course means we're pouring a bunch of money into the prize and so on. But we're also giving out Azure passes, which I think are going to get circulated or are already circulating. I think, yeah, they're going across the roads. Um, the pass has instructions on it and a code which will allow you to connect to Azure. Uh, it's got either a money cap or a time cap or both, but for the purposes of the next month, it will allow you to probably run whatever you want in Azure uh, for free, which is kind of cool. So uh, I want to emphasize, just because sometimes people equate Microsoft with Windows, that uh, of course Microsoft makes a lot more stuff than Windows, and the Azure Cloud can run pretty much anything you can think of, and it is not remotely restricted to Microsoft-esque workloads. So uh, for, for what we need, like Node.js and MongoDB, uh, it's going to be very straightforward. I'll demo it in a moment uh, to deploy our apps uh, to Azure, you can also natively run Linux workloads on a Linux virtual machine. You can do pretty much anything in the Azure cloud. So I wanted to say that just so that it doesn't feel like we're trying to convert you off of anything. Um, okay, so arises the question, fine, this is all well and good. Uh, how does how does my app use Azure? And when I say my, I guess I mostly mean yours, but in the tactical sense I mean mine. How do I put my app in Azure? Right, right now, there's two processes that are still running on my machine. How do I get them from my laptop up into Azure? Uh, so the first step is like sign up or whatever, and that'll eventually get you to this website. Uh, the cards have instructions on them for how to do that, and I've already signed up, so I'm going to mostly skip this step. Uh, and then after that, this is going to be the steps that we're going to have to go through. And I'm going to demo this over the next probably 15 or maybe 20 minutes to get the game up live. Uh, so there's two big steps that I'm going to have to do. The first one is I'm going to have to deploy my app. That's basically taking the Node.js process that's running here and putting it in the cloud. And then the second step is taking Mongo, I mean, you saw me start both of these things, taking Mongo and putting it in the cloud. And each of them is going to have three little sub-steps, uh, including a very small one-line code change in each case. Okay, should we do it? Let's do it. So first we're going to deploy the app. So to do that, we're going to create uh, an empty web app in the Azure App Service, use GitHub to pull my code into it, and then make a very small change so that it runs. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to go to portal.azure.com. Uh, here I am. So this is kind of the home page for Azure, now that I'm signed in. Uh, I can maybe zoom in? Yeah, is that better? Uh, okay, cool. So on the dashboard, you can see actually all the data centers, and you can see that they're all up. If there was like a typhoon somewhere, you'd see that one of them was down. Uh, you can see all the stuff I've made, including like when I tried this out in this demo last night. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go new. Uh, and then I'm going to choose uh, web app, uh, web app. Now, don't worry too much about following along with my every click, because uh, in my slides, I like have literally every click that I'm going to do. So this should be fairly easy to replicate in a week's time when you're actually ready to think about this. Uh, but so for now, just try to stick with the general idea. So I've deployed a web app. Uh, I'm going to give it a name. In this case, I'm going to call it Cards Against MIT. Uh, this will become my default URL. So Eventually, hopefully in 15 or 20 minutes, we'll be able to go to cardsagainstmit.azurewebsites.net and we'll all be able to access that. Uh, obviously, when Bank of America does this, they then plaster over it with a nicer URL, uh, which you can do. You can actually do it through Azure. Uh, but uh, for now, this will work. Uh, so that's the first thing. And then I have to give it a resource group. This is just like a folder. So this is I can give this any name, including the same name. Uh, and I'm going to choose Pinda Dashboard and Create. Okay, so this is going to go and it's going to find a server somewhere in an Azure data center near me uh, that is that has spare capacity, that is running Node.js, and that is willing to run my app for me. So that's going to take a minute. I can see it pinning to my dashboard here. It says deploying web app. Oh, it's already done. Uh, okay, so here we have our web app. Uh, I can see that it has the URL, cardsagainstmit.azurewebsites.net. Um, if I, just for fun, if I copy that URL uh, and I open up a new Chrome tab, uh, what I should see is that, okay, so there is something there, but it's just a placeholder, because I haven't deployed my app yet, right? So the next thing that I'm going to have to do is pull my project code in from GitHub. So you guys all learned Git last week, if you weren't already familiar with it. I've pushed everything that was in this file folder, everything you see here, with the exception of like one or two things that I've put in my Git, Git ignore, 
Uh, everything here, so my server.js and everything, is up in GitHub. Here it is, if you're familiar with the GitHub web UI. So you can see all my stuff. Uh, and so I'm going to have to pull that now from GitHub over into Azure. So to do that, I'm going to go to deployment options. Uh, I'm going to configure a deployment source. And you can see here all the different ways that I can get my code into Azure. Some of them are kind of funny. Like, I think the idea of sending it via Dropbox is kind of funny. But uh, being a serious person, very serious, uh, I'm going to use GitHub. Uh, now, the first time that you do this, you'll have to, like, a little GitHub window will pop up, and you'll have to put in your username and password and authenticate. I've already done that. And so what you'll see is that it can pull in uh, everything from my GitHub account, like all the different organizations that I'm a part of, all of my different projects. There's my repo that I want, Cards Against MIT. Uh, the master branch is fine. Uh, now, I'll take a little detour here. So there's a bunch of stuff in Azure which you can discover if you kind of poke around that's, like, really powerful and cool and kind of scary. So, like, if... If you look what's in this performance test, for example, I'm not going to set one up, but I could like ask Azure to like generate the load equivalent to one million users for five minutes. Uh, okay, I don't have enough money, uh, and it would like simulate. Maybe I don't have a lot of money at all. Can I do that? Thank you, Azure. Um, and it will uh, it will like generate traffic for me. It can do all kinds of analytics. It can do all kinds of things. There's there's all kinds of bells and whistles that we're not going to get into so much here because try to keep it simple. But anyway, so we'll click OK. What that's going to do is it's going to go pull my code from GitHub, uh, pull it down into Azure, and then it's going to look at my package.json. If I've defined a start script, it's going to run it. Otherwise, it'll just run any file it finds that sounds like app.js or server.js or something. Uh, and in very little time, I'll have, I can actually go look at the status of the deployment. Uh, and you'll see it's fetching from GitHub, spinning. This will take about a minute. Uh, so in the intervening time, we might as well do step three, because it's not going to work until we do step three anyway. Step three is a one-line code change. Or you could claim that I'm fudging it, and it's a four-line code change. Uh, somewhere in your app.js or server.js file, you probably have something that looks like app.listen on a port number. Is this familiar? Yes? I'm seeing some nodding faces. You may have it more abstracted than this if you have a config file and stuff. But basically, somewhere in your code, you have this. And that is what tells the Node.js process what port to listen on. So we are going to have to change that to get our app to run in Azure. Azure is going to give us two magical variables that it just sets the values of and passes them into our app that we can then use. They're called environment variables. The first one is node underscore env, and it's just going to contain the string in production. Uh, now, you may or may not know that the term in production when we're talking about web apps or web services basically means when it's like out in the wild being actually used by users. This is in contrast to when it's being developed, like a development environment, for example, on your laptop, where on your laptop, maybe you want to log a bunch of stuff for the console, like, you know, so you can follow along and debug your code. And when you're running it in production, you, you don't want all of that going on. You don't want the user seeing a whole bunch of output. So the first thing Azure's going to do is tell us that the environment is production. This allows us to write if statements that say, like, if production, do this. If not, do this, right? The second variable it's going to give us is a port. So it's going to because I was running Mongo locally. If I'd been running DocDB locally, I could switch to DocDB. I'm going to choose Mongo. Uh, this is actually kind of fun. I get to choose the data center it goes in. Um, I can like make my app run in Japan if I want. That's, that just sounds slow. But I could like do it. Um, like South Brazil. Uh, let's, let's do East US. That sounds local. Uh, we'll pin the dashboard and click Create. So this is going to go uh, create this database for us. Again, we can see it spinning up here. It's kind of fun, actually. You can see, like, I guess this is the Brazil one. You can see where it would have run, but now we're going to run it, like, here somewhere, which is convenient. Uh, so, okay, so the next step is we're going to insert our data into this database. Now, this is, I'm going to say it up front, this is probably the most complicated step, just in terms of, like, conceptually, it's not obvious what's going on, and it's going to be a little bit different depending on what exactly your app does. In my case, I need almost all of my data to be there before we even start playing, right? My data is a bunch of black cards with blanks and a bunch of white cards with little words. I need all those to be loaded into the game before we can start playing. Uh, in your case, you may not have data that you need to put in before you start, but I do. Um, so I'm going to create collections for the white and black cards, and then I'm going to insert my data. Uh, there is going to be detail covered in the slides that I'm not going to talk through in a ton of excruciating detail live. Um, because it's going to vary a lot depending on 
how your database is structured and what you're doing, but hopefully this will make sense. Okay, so my deployment has succeeded. I'm back in Azure. I have a NoSQL database. Uh, I don't have any collections or anything yet. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add a collection. So you guys learned about collections when you learned about Mongo last week. Yes, I'm seeing some nodding heads. Okay, that's good. Uh, so I'm going to call this collection white cards. Uh, it can handle a thousand transactions a second, and that's going to cost me $3 an hour. That seems affordable. Um, again, it's not going to cost you anything because you have the passage, but this is actually like my account. Um, okay, I'm going to create a new database. I'm going to call it, I guess, cards database. Uh, and hit OK. So that's going to create a collection. This is uh, the same step as like when you run, you know, the shell commands interacting with Mongo. You type Mongo and then you start having an interactive session on your laptop where you can create collections and list off collections and insert stuff. We're doing the same thing for the web portal. Uh, I'm going to create a second collection um, called, uh, which one did I make before? I made white cards? Yeah, okay, I'm going to make black cards. Um, put it in cards database two. Okay. So, uh, Refresh this page so that that was deleted word goes away. I've never tried doing this demo at like anything other than just 100% scale. Cool. Okay. So here we go. Uh, I can see the two collections that I made: white cards and black cards. They're both in my cards database. Okay. So now I'm gonna do something that is very specific to my app that you may or may not need to do. I'm going to uh, run a script that is going to so over here on my laptop. I have a bunch of uh, JSON files that contain, for example, uh, card definitions. So like a bunch of my friends and I like sat down and like wrote these out uh, based on like, course listings. I also have a bunch of white cards. Uh, so I'm just going to run a script that is going to uh, insert all of those into this database. Uh, now there are a bunch of different ways that you could insert documents into this database. You could write a JavaScript script as I have done. You could write a bash script, right? You could just like use the interactive Mongo shell and like run a bunch of insert commands. Uh, you may not even need to seed your database with any data if your users create all the data themselves. Like if they sign up and that creates an account, and then they make a task on their task list and that creates a task. Like if that's how your app works, you may not need to put anything in up front at all. Uh, but in my case, I need to put some cards. So uh, somewhere in your code. Uh, you presumably have something that looks like uh, this, right? It says, hey, I'm going to connect my Node.js app to my Mongo database that's running on, normally the default port is the magical 27.0.17 slash a database name. Does that look familiar? So in your server.js or app.js file, you probably have something like that. Azure is going to give us something called a connection string, which is something from the MongoDB protocol. It's basically this huge, long, scary string, the format of which is shown on this slide, uh, which allows you to specify like globally unique which database you want to talk to. So it has the server name that's running the database, and the port, and the database name, and all of the information, including you know, security information like your username and password, uh, so that my Node app in Azure can talk to my database in Azure. So I'm going to go grab that from the Azure portal. Uh, under quick start, go to Node.js. Here's a connection string, magic. I'm going to copy paste that, and uh, in my code, I'm just going to paste it in here. Put in my database name, which is cards database. And now I'm going to run my script again. I would not get, if I were you, I would not get hung up too much on what exactly this is doing. Um, scripts bootstrap deck. This is just putting all those cards into database. Okay, it has run. So now we get to our last and final step of everything, which is we have to make this one line code change to our actual app, right? We need our Node.js app in Azure, which actually, if you look at it, like I can go to GitHub and I can look at the code of what is running in Azure and you will see that I have hard coded, like the connection is to localhost this, which obviously is not going to make any sense in the cloud. So I'm going to replace that with uh, the connection string from Azure as well. The connection is copied. Copy that. Put it here. Uh, and then, because I've made a code change, I'm going to have to push that to 
Get status. Mm -hmm. uh, get add server.js. Get commit dash n. This is our second of two code changes. Code change two of two for demo. That's it. We're done. Get push origin master. And as we saw earlier, Azure is going to automatically detect that I've pushed this change up into GitHub, pull that change down, and redeploy my app. And as soon as that has happened, in theory, we're good to go. So let's, we can go to the Azure portal, we can watch that happen. Uh, I'm going to go back to my web app here to watch the deployment. Uh, you can see it's running, blah, blah, blah. You can see the requests come in. Right, there, I have these errors because the first time I tried running it, my database wasn't up yet. Right, for the sake of demos, it like, tried to get cards, and it was like, I can't get cards. So, um, okay, so let's uh, go to deployment options and see if we're done. Okay, moment of truth. Let's see if I can successfully demo something. Uh, what is it? It's cards against humanity, cards against MIT. Azure websites. Voila! All right, everyone with a laptop. Go to that URL. In theory, we can all play this game now. Or I'll put it in big on the screen. Uh, does it work? People connecting? This, is, this suspense is killing me. Someone say it's working. Oh, awesome. Cool. Fun. Everyone get it? Can I switch over? I want to show the leaderboard. All right. Do your worst, folks. Uh, we have submissions. Oh, baby. All right, I'm going to start uploading these. Uh, what do we got? Introduction to sexting with an emphasis on a lifetime of sadness. Oh, oh my god. Uh, the relationship between friction, bonding, and mat dating. Hell yeah. Um, wow, you guys are just twisted people. Techniques for controlling poor life choices using operating systems. Nice. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> Introduction to freshmen with emphasis on the November. <laughs> Someone got out with perfect hands. <laughs> Look what I found. I will say, when I took 7012, it wasn't that interesting. <laughs> Student teams are immersed in pain. Wow. Well, I think we can agree that uh, this yeah. app is live and it's playable. And I can just leave it there because it's costing like a few cents per unit time. Um, I think there's a pretty clear winner here. Like, out of curiosity, does anyone want to take credit for the freshman November one? Where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful stash. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, so the fun thing is, I can I can actually see like all of our traffic, right? If I go to my overview, I can see all of y'all playing this thing with a bunch of requests coming in every couple seconds. Um, and it's a good fun. Uh, so there's all kinds of tools here that you can use. You can like integrate with push notifications and send push notifications to phones like there's it's a it's a candy store uh, but in terms of our minimal demo taking an app that was running on my laptop and getting it up into the cloud where it's on the real live internet in less than 20 minutes I think we did it so uh, to review we deployed the app by creating a web app using the Azure app service we pulled my code in from github we made a one-line code change then we created an empty database using the Azure NoSQL service we inserted my data, and we did a one-line code change. And uh, you can all go do this with your apps, because you have Azure passes uh, for I don't know how long, and I don't know how much money, but it says on them. So you should go to town. Uh, now, there is another announcement that I want to make. I don't know if this has been said before. Um, Microsoft is going to be picking what we think is the, our favorite app that ran on Azure. So you have to run on Azure to be eligible for this. Uh, and then we're going to give everyone in that team an Asus Transformer Mini, which is like a really nice all-metal two-in-one that I think is kind of neat. Uh, so we're giving one of those to every member of the, the team that we think does the coolest app that uses Azure this year. Uh, one other thing that I was asked to tell you is that uh, there's this thing called the Imagine Cup, which is like a big tournament that Microsoft runs every year. 
there's like $100,000 in prizes, there's a, a US final and then a worldwide final. There was actually an MIT team called Team Tactile that made it to the semifinal last year. Um, so you guys should, at the end of this class, like just take your app and submit it to that too, because what's the downside? Um, all, the, all the details again are in the slides here. So with that, uh, this was fun. Thank you very much. Uh, I can hang out and take questions because we have a lot of time.